90% reduction in the number of redoses, i.e. a lot less work, and more than 90% of patients in anesthesia providers really thought the technique was, uh, like the technique. So what are the ideal PCA settings? Well, I think you already know this one, and that is there are none, and that's because there's a lot of different ways that you can accomplish the same thing. This is certainly something that we've found, and it depends on what your goals are that you're trying to achieve. So the, this next series of slides is sort of my take on PCEA. I did a literature review, and I'll tell you my take, then we'll look at a, uh, um, a meta-analysis and a review article. So I found 33 um, studies with more than 2,000 patients that received PCEA. And what you see here is sort of a shotgun kind of approach, and that's why there's not any ideal settings, because there hasn't been the definitive large study. What you see is a lot of variation. Uh, a lot of different techniques are, are studied, lots of um, variation in all the parameters, the basal rate, the bolus dose, the lockout. Half the studies didn't even use a basal rate. And so what did they find? Uh, there's a predominant theme here, and if you look at it, nearly every study finds benefits to using PCEA. And the two biggest ones are the drug use and um, the decreased workload. Now what's interesting is in order to decrease the number of redoses that you, you need, you really need to have that basal infusion. And most people that use PCAA run the basal infusion to reduce the amount of redoses that you, that you need. Uh, at the bottom, there really aren't, weren't any disadvantages found in any of these studies. So lots of variation, no definitive large study, um, which is why there isn't an ideal regimen. But the two goals that you want is to titrate the analgesia so that you're giving patients what they need and you want to reduce your workload. There, when, when it was first developed, there were lots of theoretical uh, disadvantages. The overdose potential, we've probably all seen that with PCA morphine, where the patients keep hitting the button because they're afraid they're going to hurt, then they get respiratory depression. So we're worried about high spinals. And in all of those studies, there were none of the, no, no cases of disadvantage or high spinals reported. And we now have been using PCEA for more than 25 years, and all of the disadvantages just didn't pan out. This was a meta-analysis uh, about 15 years ago, and it was PCEA versus continuous uh, infusion, more than 640 patients. And what they found, uh, the top part's really not surprising if you look at it, that there wasn't any, uh, there was no difference in uh, patient satisfaction or analgesia, and that's because these are study conditions, and under study conditions, when the patients hurt, you gave them a redose. And if you really think about it, the patient doesn't care how you're, you're giving them medicine as long as they're comfortable. So all of these patients were comfortable, so you didn't see increased satisfaction. Um, but what you did see was uh, less motor block, less drug use, and the number one benefit of um, PCA was decreased workload. This is the review article, looked at a probably about the same number of patients that I did when I showed you the other 29 studies, more than 2,000 patients receiving PCEA. And again, under study conditions, no significant differences in outcome or satisfaction. Um, they report that there was no ideal dose or lockout, but it was the basal infusion that decreased the number of redoses and improves analgesia. Now this is very different when you're looking at PCEA epidural analgesia compared to IV, PCA, and, and narcotics. With narcotics, you don't want a basal infusion because that increases side effects without improving analgesia. With labor analgesia, it's different. You do want the basal infusion, and it's really to reduce workload. Um, I'll throw this in because it was kind of funny, but this was a sentinel event. This is where they were using continuous infusion and then switched over to PCEA, uh, about 3,600 deliveries a year, and they found similar stuff. Decreased pain, satisf increased satisfaction, decreased motor block, and the most significant thing was the number of interventions was significantly reduced. And what they reported was that making that change uh, produced the advantages demonstrated in the literature, and basically it made our midwives really happy they were from England, and if our midwives are happy, then we're happy. So they really touted PCEA. So what is our experience? We um, have a really busy unit, about 6,500 deliveries a year, and we were doing a lot of work. 
with the continuous infusions. And so we were early adopters. We've probably used PCA in over 150,000 patients um, so far. We've been through one syringe pump and three different infusion pumps. And we would agree that it's significantly reduced workload, has an excellent safety record, and we didn't see, we've never seen any cases of device failure or toxicity, and the benefits are clear. So what's our recommended protocol? Our goal was to reduce workload. We used dilute, bupivacaine, and fentanyl. We tried the 0.0625, and what we found is when we did that, we had a significant amount of breakthrough pain, so then we were getting called to do redoses, and that's exactly what we were trying not to. We found that the 0.1 um, reduced that incidence. And then these are fairly typical um, settings that you see uh, in the literature and you also see when you talk to people what they're using, but we run a basal infusion of 10 mLs an hour with the 5 mL demand bolus, and that's important for the next part of the lecture. So the evidence is clear that PCEA is superior to continuous infusion and intermittent bolus techniques, and for all of you that are out there that are still using that, you're doing a lot of work and you ought to think about changing to the newer technology. Which brings us to PIEB. And what is PIEB? It's basically just PCEA, but you change things up a little bit. If you think about it, if you run a basal infusion at 10, 10 mLs an hour, it's one mL every six minutes. So if you hold the catheter up, you could just watch the local anesthetic drip, 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 and over time, you can imagine that it forms like a little puddle and it doesn't really spread very well in the epidural space. It's, you know, it spreads okay, but just you still get called for breakthrough pain and to do the redoses. So the thinking was, let's take that basal infusion and instead of just running it as drip, 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 let's every five minutes give a five ml bolus or once an hour, I mean, every 30 minutes give a five ml bolus or once an hour just give that 10 ml background infusion and what you're gonna do is get better spread and if you get better spread, you're gonna actually have more comfortable patients and if they're more comfortable, they're gonna hit their button less and if they're hitting their button less, then it's gonna actually make it even better than PCEA. All right, and so if you have better analgesia, you ought to then reduce drug use, workload even further, and side effects. So a lot of action happening up here. It's all right, we're good. All right, so uh, as I've said, PIB's been out for about uh, 12 years, and already, you know, I did another literature search. This is my stuff again. I uh, found 10 studies, more than 1,000 patients have received PIEB. And what you're gonna see is very similar to what happened with PCEA, sort of the shotgun approach. And this is what you get. We already have like nine different solutions compared and lots of variation in the basal range and the recipes and the dosing interval um, from as little as three mLs every 30 minutes up to 10 every 60. So you're gonna see similar kind of findings and it looks very similar to the PCA, except you'll notice that there was significantly more advantages with PCEA. And if you think about it, when you went from the continuous infusion technique to PCA, that, that's a big change in the technology and what you're doing. You're not only um, you know, running that background infusion, but you're allowing the patient to give themselves more boluses. What we're doing here is when we go from PCA to PIB, you're just taking PCA and just changing how you administer that, that background infusion. So, not quite the same percentage of, of uh, benefits, and at the same time, the two biggest benefits that you see is decreased drug use and decreased workload, so there is potential to make our job even easier. Now, this was the meta-analysis that compared PIB to PCA. 350 patients received PIEB, and what they found, a uh, very similar duration of labor, mode of delivery, no change, but decreased drug utilization, However, if you look at that, it's only 1.9 milligrams an hour, so you go from 11 milligrams to nine. Increased maternal satisfaction, it's only seven millimeters on a 100 millimeter scale. And workload in the meta-analysis was a trend towards being significant, but it was not. And this was the interventions was P of 0.08. The drug use was 
0.006 and satisfaction, even though it was only seven millimeters, there were lots of patients, so it was highly significant. I told you I have nothing to disclose, but I'm going to name names. There's four devices. Actually, I thought there were going to be four devices on the market. There's actually only three. The other one still hasn't been released, not ready for use. I thought it would be by now. Each of the devices has limitations. And the reason that there are limitations when you think about it is that when we went from a continuous infusion pump to a PCA pump, we didn't really ask it to do a whole lot of things different. It still was running a background infusion and just when a patient hits a button, give a little bolus. Well, now we're asking a lot of these pumps and technology is different. So now we are taking that background infusion and we're giving it every 30 minutes or every 60 minutes, so you have to have an internal clock, you need a computer to run it, but we also want these devices to be wireless, and we also want these devices to now communicate with our EMRs, and making that happen is much, much easier said than done. So the Hospira Sapphire pump, which we have, and we can talk a lot more about that later uh, during our question and answer session, um, and I pick on it first because this is what we're using, but it's not wireless and it's not EMR um, compatible. Now, they have the same pump that is being marketed and sold for IV infusions and it is wireless and it is EMR compatible, so they just haven't upgraded the epidural pumps to, to be so. Um, we found out the hard way that you can't toggle between PCA and PIB, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then finally, um, the little computer, the pump itself, it has special batteries, and we didn't realize it had special batteries until uh, it says the battery life is dead. It doesn't matter if the batteries are still running or not, and what the pumps do is shut down. You can't just plug it in and say, I don't really care about a battery. You can't take out the batteries. You have to have Hospira come out and change the batteries. It's great. Uh, yeah, awesome. So uh, the next pump is the uh, B-Bron Bodyguard. Um, not yet released, but when it is, it is supposed to be fully wireless and integrated with uh, the EMRs. Uh, I've seen it out here. The CAD Solus from Smith Medical. It was the first pump approved by the FDA. I've talked to people who use it, said that it's wonderful. Um, some issues, still not wireless. It'll be coming soon. Still not EMR compatible. And when you buy it, and these are the kind of questions you have to ask, it doesn't come with an AC adapter. So it uses regular batteries, not special Hospira batteries or Smith Medical batteries, but they apparently run down pretty quickly, uh, like every 90 hours or so, so that you have to change them pretty frequently. So for labor and delivery, since the patients aren't all that mobile, you can simply buy the AC adapters and save money. And then you have the um, Care Fusion from Alaris and uh, our healthcare system actually went to Alaris for all of the IV pumps, but we did not want them for labor and delivery because they don't have the capability to use a 250 ml bag. They only use the 60 ml syringe for right now. So in our mind, that's going backwards to what we had back in the 90s, and you then have to change the, the syringe much more frequently than you do the PCA bags. So the PIB technology is here. It still isn't quite ready for prime time, um, but in the very near future, these all will be wireless and will be um, EMR compatible. So if your old pumps are running out and you need to purchase something, then what I would suggest is that you work with administration, work with IT, get all of these companies to come in and to do a pump fair, to put your hands on it and to ask all of these questions. And most important of all is, whatever they tell you, and when you're ready to buy, get what they say in writing. And I guess the last thing which we didn't do is um, they can be programmed for PCA and they can be programmed for PIEB, but the PIEB technology does work. It does uh, give the boluses as scheduled, and on top of the boluses, the patient still hits the demand button when they need extra medicine, so it's wonderful. But start using the PIEB mode. I guess I might as well tell you, there's a glitch in our pumps so that I, we programmed it to do both and we started them all with PCEA. And so when 
It's a simple little thing. You say, what care area do you want? You could just say, go to PIEB. And when you do that, the pumps freeze. They just don't work. It's great, again. So we're still using PCEA. So uh, just throw this slide in. Um, that it's the future of PCEA. It's actually CIIB, and that is Computer Integrated Intermittent Bolus. And the idea behind this is it's a computer that's attached to the patient. And the more the patient hits the button, that means they need more. So it'll increase the bolus size, and it will decrease the interval between boluses. Or as the patient hits the button less often, it'll do the opposite. So you're actually titrating even more to the patient's needs than what we, we have now. So theoretically, this is gonna be that perfect anesthetic that Kenneth talked about today. Uh, you're gonna further reduce the dose and improve satisfaction even more. But, you know, good God, this is a picture of what it is. It's got the little computer hooked to it. We can't even get PIEB to work. We're, we're not ready for this yet and it's not commercially available. So in summary, we have 25 years of clinical experience with PCEA. The benefits are clear. The biggest benefit of all is to you all in that it significantly decreases the amount of workload that you or your department or your section is actually using excellent safety record. Uh, patients do like it and feel like they're in control and it's just my opinion, it has always been that if it saves you time and work, you're gonna love it. In terms of PIEB, um, probably has advantages over PCA, decreased drug use, decreased workload, and increased maternal satisfaction. The, the, um, the benefits have been demonstrated in the literature, but you know, how much of a clinical difference is that gonna make if you were using PCA? Now for all of you out there that have been using continuous infusion, if you switch to that, it'll be a huge difference. Uh, the current devices have limitations, but coming soon they will be ready for prime time. And purchase it if you're in the market and remember start with the PIEB mode. So compared to continuous infusion intermittent bolus techniques, these techniques are state of the art and you should be using them. Thank you and if you have questions, I mean, I'll be, I'll be glad to answer them here in a bit, but this is my email, rdangelo at wakehealth.edu. Be glad to share any of this information or questions, answer questions. And I thank you all. <laughs>